buildings um, in kind of a campus-like setting. Uh, they were designed by Nathan Wyeth in the 1930s. Um, he's best known for uh, his design of the Oval Office and the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Um, and you can see that uh, this entire site is formed by mature hardwood forests. And then you have these kind of fingers of development encroaching into it. Um, and this is just to give you an idea of the scale of the site. Um, it's very walkable. Uh, the entire site is 216 acres, which is quite large but the buildings only sit on 60. Um, and here's just a little bit of site analysis um, to show you that there's some very interesting topography here. All of the buildings sit on the top of hills. Um, here, this is a pretty busy road, Annapolis Road right here. Glendale Road is a less trafficked road that kind of divides the, the campus. And this is a defunct uh, uh, railway line right here. There used to be a stop, um, and now it's a pretty popular hiking and biking trail um, lots of snapping turtles, and um, you can also see that there are some bodies of water to the north. And again, here's some site sections, just you can see that this is a building and this is a building, um, and there is um, a lot of just really interesting topography along the site. Um, it's very bucolic. Um, and <clears throat> so when I was looking at this project, I didn't really know a lot about the history of tuberculosis, the history of tuberculosis hospitals, um, so tuberculosis was killing a lot of people in the 1900s, um, and tuberculosis is a bacterial infection that uh, most often the effects are concentrated in the lungs. Um, it was especially uh, a health problem in D.C., um, where they just couldn't keep up with the number of hospital beds that were needed. Um, it was spreading pretty rapidly, uh, especially in um, uh, children. So in 1933, D.C., bought some land in Maryland, uh, built the Children's Hospital, which is uh, this first image, this first building that you can see. You can see it's a bar building with uh, wings. Um, and then it rapidly expanded um, to include an adult hospital here um, and lots of other um, facilities, such as this is a nurse's residence. Um, there were doctor's apartments. There were laundry facilities. Um, there was a water tower. Um, and here is a map showing you uh, the buildings that are on the National Register. Um, so for those who aren't familiar with historic preservation, um, it's very limiting in what you can do to buildings. Um, it really restricts your design choices. Um, and the contributing buildings, which are all of the ones in black, are kind of the ones that you can barely touch. Um, and the other ones you can eliminate um, or uh, redesign entirely. So. And um, this is just to give you an idea of some of the sites. And this is the water tower. This is one of the doctor's apartments. This is the nurses' um, residences right here, which is uh, two buildings connected with an arcade. Um, this is the major hospital, the adult. Um, it's the largest one on the site. It's five stories. The children's hospital is only two. And you can see these kind of beautiful um, sleeping wings right here which the patients would go um, to receive uh, fresh air and sunlight. Um, you can also tell that the buildings are in a state of deterioration. Um, the building um, stopped being used in 1982. The advent of antibiotics, obviously, um, they didn't need it anymore. They weren't quite sure what to use it for. Um, but nevertheless, um, all of the major landscape features and building features still retain their integrity. Um, and I didn't know anything about the site before I went to go see it because I didn't want my impressions of it to be colored by anything that I had read. Um, and what I discovered was that it oddly reminded me of being in an English garden, um, which I, I toured a lot of when I, when I lived in England. And these buildings were kind of set like follies. And I just thought it was so beautiful, and I, you know, you can't really even see the developments because of the hardwood forests. And I thought, wow, this is really special um, because you don't get that in a in a very urban environment, um, especially in D.C. Um, and so the buildings are really organized around these view sheds. Um, so you know, every time you like go to a building and look out, there's kind of this, you know, beautiful. Um, building or 
um, trees, or you can see the water tower. Um, and they are, these buildings are situated okay for sol solar orientation, um, not so great for wind. Um, but it, it really, it, it speaks to how tuberculosis sanatoriums were designed. Um, for a while, no one knew what caused tuberculosis. Uh, some people looked to genetics. It was even linked to uh, vampires. Um, <laughs> and so the history of the design of these tuberculosis hospitals uh, links back to a German student who went to the Himalayas, Hermann Bremer, and he was miraculously cured after being in the mountains for a while. And then he thought, oh, it's really about fresh air and sunlight and views to nature. And other people started, you know, to believe the same idea. Um, and insane asylums were designed around the same principles, so they have the same building typology. And a name that you'll hear a lot is Thomas Kirkbride um, and Kirkbride plans, which is this kind of flattened V shape right here. Um, he wrote a manual on how to design hospitals. So a lot of the hospitals that you'll see are after his designs. And men would be on one wing, women would be on the other wing, um, and then usually they'll have a little offshoot on either side for the patients that they would deem the sickest. Um, and so I started thinking, like, oh, you know, views to nature, um, healing gardens aren't anything new. Uh, this is a hospital that I saw in Sri Lanka. It's from the 800s. Um, and all of these rooms um, are designed to have a central viewing place of this garden right here. Um, and the moral treatment in the 1700s, um, monasteries, all kinds of hospitals have been designed around this idea that nature is healing. Um, and I was fortunate enough to have heard a talk from a landscape architect at UVA um, who talked about healing gardens and biophilia. So biophilia is uh, really this, um, this term that was coined by Harvard biologist Edward Wilson. Um, in short, biophilia is a human tendency to gravitate towards nature, um, and that nature has a healing effect. Um, and really, the persistence of uh, garden-oriented um, hospitals can be attributed to this. Um, and so, there have been lots of scientific studies that show that nature can heal. So, studies by Robert Ulrich from Texas at A&M um, show that patients recovered from gallbladder surgery um, recovered more quickly if they had used to nature outside of their window instead of a brick wall. And he was very particular in um, making sure that uh, he controlled the different variables. So, had they been hospitalized before? Um, did they smoke before the hospital were they on? Um, and more recently, a mental health charity, uh, Mind in Britain, showed that people walking through natural landscapes had reduced stress, as opposed to walking in other environments such as shopping malls. Um, serotonin levels are, are linked to increased levels of sunlight, um, which inhibit um, you know, pain pathways to the central nervous system. So really, if you think about this, this explains a lot of why we like natural landscape paintings and why we have uh, screensavers of nature on our computer and why people like to spend time at golf courses. Um, so knowing this and knowing that there was this really special area in Washington DC that you couldn't get somewhere else, this healing garden, um, kind of what population could we use it for? What population would benefit the most from it? Um, so I really looked at what populations could benefit from a therapeutic garden, what would be financially viable, and then also I talked to members of the community. What do you want? Um, and the community of Prince George's County is rapidly aging. Over 20% of the population is over the age of 65. They want to stay in their community. There are only two uh, senior facilities in the entire area, um, so it's very much needed. So. I decided to um, design a, a senior center. And again, this site is very complicated. There's a lot of values. There's sustainability, there's transportation, there's artistic merits. Um, so in order to make design decisions, I created a schedule of values and prioritized certain things. Um, so number one, biophilia. 
Um, everything that I designed was going to have to relate to nature. Um, two, historic. Um, the site is on the National Register. Um, it's a historic resource that needs to be respected. And three, community. Um, because I'm placing a, populations that, a population that is at risk to be isolated, seniors, on a site that was designed to be isolated, a tuberculosis hospital, that's something that I really need to take into account. Um, so, in order to do this, um, I looked at doing a continuing care retirement community. And what that is, is that is a senior center that offers everything from independent living units um, to nursing home to hospice care. It has dining halls, it has social clubs, it's kind of, you know, the Cadillac of senior housing. Um, and how to make it economically feasible. I talked to some planners in the area, and I went to some senior housing conventions, and I learned that you really needed to include all of these different amenities, which not only supported the residents, but also drew the neighboring community in. Um, so this, again, was helping to promote this sense of community. Um, then another uh, kind of complication of the project was that there is this magic number with continuing care retirement communities where 400 independent living units is really this magic number to support all of this retail that you put on the site. Um, and so I have this historic site and I have biophilia as a priority, which is kind of these uninterrupted views of a landscape but now I need to somehow accommodate 400 units. So I developed a design strategy, which was to retain this historic core right here, all of these buildings where the topography is higher, and then build new developments where the topography is lower with green roofs, um, kind of tuck them in. And then this part right here would be untouched and a porous boundary um, of park paths um, and landscape that uh, the residents of the senior community and the neighbors could use. Um, and again, this also added to the sense of community. Um, there have been many studies that show that green spaces promote interaction. Um, a 1988 study by Quan, Sullivan, and Wiley um, showed that common uh, green outdoor spaces were a strong predictor in community interaction. Makes a lot of sense if you think about it. If you go to a bingo event for seniors, it's very structured, it's very formal. Um, you may not do it again, but if you're out for your morning run um, and you see the same woman on the bench every day, it starts out as a hello, and then hello, how the weather's pretty nice, and then hello, the weather's pretty nice, how's your Thanksgiving? Um, so that was the idea. Um, and again, here you can just see this diagrammatic, this is the area for opportunity here. Um, and this is where the historic core uh, would be preserved. Um, the site is rather large, so um, I focused on this area here of the adult hospital because it is the largest building on the site and also because there is a lake right here, um, so there are some areas for opportunity. Um, and so this is the first floor design, um, and there are restaurants, um, there is a senior dining hall, there are some uh, units on the first floor, and there is a path that kind of, again, adds to this idea of the site being porous. Um, and here are the additional floors. Um, it uh, allowed for 25 independent living units in this area. Um, one of the other things that I had to combat was this idea of, you know, the building has a really institutional feel. Um, so I created metaphorical lungs to let light and air and sun into the building um, by basically removing the roof, um, carving out the structure, um, but keeping the facade, so retaining the historic integrity. Um, and that would allow these kind of shared courtyards where neighbors could interact. Um, and also it allowed more sunlight into the units. Um, and on some of the other spaces, um, just leaving, leaving the ceiling off um, instead of replacing it. Uh, this had, you know, already collapsed in, but making it a nice kind of garden secondary entrance into the rear of the adult hospital. 
And here's where you can see the new intervention right here nestled into the hillside that has these green roofs. Um, and here you can see that it kind of creates a continuous landscape. Um, so you are allowed these new developments, um, but again, you still get this effect of looking out onto nature, um, and you still retain the historic integrity of the site. Um, these are the uh, new developments right here um, that have parking um, where there isn't much sunlight. Um, and so here you can see that there's this courtyard space that's created, um, so even the parking gets natural light. Um, and then uh, I call it a stramp, it's a stair ramp combination that, you know, this promenade down to the lake so that people of all physical abilities um, can kind of enjoy that view. Um, and then here is a section of the units, and so you can see that everyone kind of gets this nice view out to the lake, and this person here would be looking over a green roof. Um, so again, it's uninterrupted. Um, and then uh, here are some of the unit designs, and you can see that the, the theme of looking out to nature is continued here. So the eating, the living, the sleeping space, um, they're all designed so that you look out. Um, and this is actually a unit that was designed with the idea of community. Um, so it's multiple bedrooms, so seniors can share the cost of living. Um, uh, Low-income senior housing is one of the highest um, housing markets in demand, um, and so wouldn't be for everyone to share an apartment um, at a later age in life, but it definitely would be for some people. Um, and so really the takeaways from this are that there are all of these grandiose, beautiful buildings um, that no one knows what to do with because of their size, um, but they really have this unique opportunity of offering the therapeutic benefits of a garden setting. Um, and there is an urgent and growing need for senior housing that we're going to have to address. Um, and then kind of for future studies, I think that economic feasibility is absolutely something that needs to be studied more thoroughly. Transportation, um, you know, there could be a shared shuttle or you could look at um, bringing the railway stop back. Um, so thank you very much for the questions. Yeah. Um, interesting project. Uh, and I think you've mentioned a couple of times talking about community. So I'm curious about how either in the literature you cited or how the project team uh, defined and perhaps operationalized community. Um, so, the sense of community was definitely a broad concept, um, and it was one that um, I personally defined as um, bringing different ages together. Um, so, it not being seniors living in isolation, which is what typically happens, um, and in the, one of the only two senior, actually both senior communities um, in that area, one of them is gated and only seniors. Um, the other one is called uh, Leisure World. And it is like, it has its very own weird kind of like belt play. Um, and, and no one else goes there. So there's no kids, there's no shared grocery. Um, there's no shared amenities of any type, actually. So that was really my goal for creating community. 